We spent so much time the past couple of days with family. Me and Dale were talking this morning and last night, remembering back to our days of, of the holidays. And all we wanted to do was work out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we spent time with family. We'd go down to our grandparents and stuff like that. But we spent so much time just wanting to do our stuff. We spent our holidays stuff. in so many different places yeah. over the years. And when you're trying to work out in different places, it's really hard. Oh, where's the nearest gym? YMCA, Lifetime Fitness, 24-hour fitness, just wherever we could wherever we could find a gym. It's really kind of silly, like you said, when you pay two, three hundred dollars a month for a gym, you can't. Yeah, you almost do better it. off in the gyms where you pay twenty dollars a month. All right, guys, here we are, athletic baseball. Uh, this time, not in the juice box. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada, Sin City. Here at the home of Dr. Dale Bartek. Special edition. Special holiday edition for you guys. You know, before we get too far into this, guys, you know, I promised I was going to answer some questions for you guys on this episode. So we can we can kind of dive right into that. Um, Dale, we got three pretty good questions. And I have this not time. seen the questions yet. Dale so has not I'm, seen the questions. Really... <laughs> so I'm going to break them out, yeah. you know, one at a time, and uh, we'll both kind of give our feedback on on what that looks like. But First question that I thought was a really good question, and as soon as the guy who asked this question sees it, he's going to be like, okay, finally somebody's answering this question. And there's no easy way to answer it, but the question was, you know, why do coaches choose the bigger players over smaller players who sometimes might actually have a better skill set or do things more fundamentally sound? Like, why do people choose the bigger player? Like, like size the size, yeah, like, like size and weight. strength. And this, you know... This was a 14-year-old kid who asked this question. Yeah. So we all know that this applies big time to that age group. Dale, give your feedback okay. on Okay, so like I said, I didn't look at the questions before, but this is really good. Now, why a coach might select a player that's bigger, so many answers. The first thing that comes to my mind is maybe projectability and durability. A lot of times bigger players... They get hurt less, and they're just more projectable. Like even if the skill set is not fully developed, a bigger guy has the potential maybe to do more stuff. Yeah. Just as, as a blanket, a blanket statement. Yeah. Now, if you're a 14 year old, what's really funny about that age is that you'll often find the best players on the field at that age are the biggest players. Yeah. And so I think that's not necessarily the case as you go through the ranks playing the game. But in the context of the person asking the question, I think, oh, well, why does the coach like the bigger player? Maybe because the bigger player is a little stronger. They're a little bit more capable. They're a little bit more projectable. Like I said, with the durability thing, I think that comes in later on as you get into college and as you get into the, the professional ranks. A 165-pound pitcher statistically gets hurt more than a 225-pound pitcher. Yeah. Well, and at 14, yeah, you know, at 14, you have... Here's the other thing. There's a lot of mistakes. Like players make mistakes in middle school and early in high school. So as a coach, what you want is you want those mistakes to be less detrimental. Yeah. And a bigger, stronger, faster player gets away with more. Yeah. You know, they're, they're able to overcome some of the mistakes that smaller guys and weaker guys on the field just can't handle yet. It's not that they're not going to be able to handle it down the road. But there's less room for error for those yeah. bigger players. And I, I really think that's why coaches kind of migrate towards, okay, like we've got two guys that are similar skill sets. One is 5'8", and one is 5'2". We're going to go with the 5'8 guy. People forget that baseball is a power sport. The bigger, the stronger, the faster athletes, they have the advantage. Yeah. That's not the case in every sport. I could probably think of some sports where that's not the case. But in baseball, it's still a factor. So... You know, there's 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 that underlying need for strength and power, and strength and power usually is accompanied by size. Right. You know. Right. But definitely a really really good question, especially coming from a younger guy who's probably trying to, you know, feel things out, and he's seen that maybe some of the bigger players are better right now, and the bigger players are going to be getting more opportunities, and maybe it might feel like the coach likes them just because they're bigger. But there's a little bit more to it. Yeah, there's definitely more to it, yeah. and like. For you guys that are out there that are having this question and this concern, 
like it's not always going to be this way. Yeah. You, you're not going to stay five foot tall forever. Some of you guys that are a little bit later in blooming, you're not going to stay a small midget forever. You know, you're you're going to grow. You guys are going to get bigger. This you're going to develop. Especially frustrating for us around that age because yep. I was the smallest kid on the field at 14, 13. And I remember feeling the same way, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. That kid's only good because he's big. If I was just bigger, I'd be better and the coach would like me more, you know. And, yeah. Um, as, as, as you grow and as the game uh, progresses, things balance out a little bit. Right. No, but really good question overall. And like kind of a, a almost impossible question to really give a perfect answer on too. Well, and it, you know, it may or may not make you guys feel any better about what you're doing. Yeah. You know, like you, you're not going to like the fact that the coach is still going to pick the, you might understand it better, but you're not going to like the fact that he's picking the bigger player, quote unquote, over you. Yeah. You know, so you guys keep keep grinding and working hard. You smaller players, learn your skill sets, understand the game. That's only going to do better things for you going forward as you as you do grow and develop. So, um, really good question. A plus question. Yeah. Second question. This was actually from a coach. Um, great question. It's probably been asked to us a million times already, but I I like answering it and I like. I like reevaluating my answer over time because I think it changes. And Dale, you're probably going to have your own set of yeah. answers to this. The question was, what are the three best training exercises for building explosiveness in baseball? By training, I'm assuming we're meaning in the, in the gym. In the gym. Like, you know, strength and conditioning. Yeah. This is another great question. Let's. I'm going to answer this first from, from my standpoint, which is, you said the, the exercises that make you feel the most explosive? Yep. So the way you your body feels and the way your body actually is responding to something might be different. The things that made me feel physically stronger and the things that made me feel an immediate transfer when I got on the field was a deadlift. When I could take a lot of weight and pick it up off the floor, that immediately made me feel stronger, made me feel more powerful, and I feel like that transferred over into the game. For me... A press, like a bench press, like just literally being able to grab a, a barbell or dumbbells, bring them down to my chest and push them back up. Mm -hmm. And that's something we used when we were a lot younger to really um, measure our strength. That was like right. a big measurement strength. How much can you bench? Like what is your max bench? So when I was right. seeing those numbers go up, that made me feel a lot stronger. The third one for me, I'd have to say would be some sort of like pull down or a pull up. Mm -hmm. Maybe even more so like a pull up, like being able to get on a bar and pull your body up and down right? and to be able to do that multiple times, like feeling your lats work for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's another one that really makes you, makes you feel explosive and powerful. Now those are maybe very different answers from what you'd ask from a strength coach or, you know, even some of our coaches that work with us, they right. might have, you know, more, um, transferable movement patterns that are more, you know, directly related to rotation. Some, pe some people would maybe say like throwing a med ball, right? But right. for me, it was just those traditional movements where I was able to see the weight going up. Yeah. You know? No, that's, that's good. I, I'm going to relate it back to my personal experiences too. Um, mine are a little bit different. Like you, Dale, you just brought up, you know, a traditional hinge pattern, a, a deadlift, yeah. a good old fashioned deadlift. Um, and then you had two upper body exercises, one of one, a pushing and one a pulling exercise. And, you know, both obviously have their own benefits. Yeah. I'm going to go down a different route. Like if we're talking about strength training and lifting weights, like there was nothing that made me feel stronger than a, than a box squat. I, heavy I, I box thought squat. you would say that. Yeah. yeah. And like being able to say, okay, like I know I have some support at the bottom of the move. I can control the weight on the way down and I can just use everything I have to power this weight up. And I remember like being very, very young, like a freshman in high school and the first time doing a box squat and almost getting like too big for my britches. And I can, if, if I'm remembering right, I remember putting 315 on my back as a 115 pound freshman and I went down with it. Yeah. I, I, I could eccentrically control it. I could hold the weight. I went down with it. Now my spine did a little worm yeah. dance on the Man's way back up curve, and, yeah. and I had to have a, a spotter help me back up. But just being able to put that weight on my back 
that's what Absolutely. I was going to say. Like just having like weight on your back yeah. and feeling that it definitely makes you feel strong. And truthfully, it do, it makes you stronger. It does. Like it, it does. actually makes you stronger. Just the bracing and the and the you know holding you know being able to hold your pelvis and yeah. hold your core in place like. That so made me feel strong. That's a common denominator right away between the deadlift and the squat. It's just something heavy. Right. Like something right. abnormally heavy, something that's two, maybe even three times your body weight. Right. Being able to just do something with it. My other two, a little bit more untraditional, you know. So when we moved to Florida and we had, you know, the big open hallways in the house and everything. Remember we had those those rounded off uh what do you call the, the overhangs to the hallway? Not pillars, but mm -hmm. they were high. Yeah. And when we first moved in, I remember not being able to jump and touch them. Yeah. And then like, as you grow older, like being in high school, I remember like just getting a little running start and just jumping up and yeah. whole palm in the whole thing. Be like, fuck yeah. You know, and like jumping, yeah, like things where I was forced to be able to jump vertically and horizontally that made me strong. So I liked training those methods. Like, a broad jump, yeah. Um, a high box jump. I absolutely like that. Made me feel so explosive, and like going down the road a little bit further. That kind of started my obsession with speed yeah. and, and sprinting. Yeah, that's that's really a, a, a contrast a little bit from what I was saying because you're talking about having like feeling good about being able to express your strength, right? jumping and running right where for me what made me feel stronger was actually just being able to move something exhibit the strength right right so you're talking about like strength expression right that's interesting that you felt that way because for me i was just like well i just want to be able to lift the weight if i can lift the weight that'll make me feel stronger but right. that's a really really good thing and i remember when we were young we did so much jumping and agility training and speed training and it never actually made me feel that much stronger. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, every, everybody's yeah. a little bit everybody's different. different. So our answers are very different there. You know, and, and to the coach asking this question, there are no correct three answers to this. But generally speaking, like if you could pick the three best movements to feel explosive, to get yourself explosive, um, like on the strength patterning side, a box squat, a heavy deadlift, a trap bar deadlift, um, an elevated deadlift, something yeah. where you, you, you're in a more friendly position to be able to move a heavier load. Those things are going to make you feel strong and explosive. A great place to start, you know, is to like understand just the foundational patterns. Right. So like a hip hinge would be a deadlift. Right. Uh, a lunge, a reverse lunge is a movement you can really load up a lot. Um, like you said, a squat, box squat, barbell squat, front squat, whatever that might be. Then you have like a press and a pull. Finding something in each of those categories right. to really start pushing the strength right. will really help you start to understand what it feels like to right. actually be getting stronger. Yeah, our third and final question here. Um, <laughs> what was baseball like in Montana? So we probably have two different answers for this because our times playing there, you know, Dale's two and a half years younger than I am. So obviously he was a much younger ball player. Uh, at the time we moved from Montana to Florida, for those of you guys who know our, our journey there. But, you know, like for me, I just remember starting baseball late. You know, like really you started, late. yeah, you you played t-ball. Yeah. I, I never played t-ball. I never played coach pitch. Like I started when I was nine. I was going to say you were either nine or ten. And for me, it was like playing catch up. So like my first year playing baseball were in Montana. You know, you only play two months out of the year. You play May yeah. and June. Um Man, I remember showing up to the like those first couple practices and even the games, and it was cold. I think it even snowed a couple games that season. And I remember thinking, like, okay, like I haven't really played this game much. I know a little bit about it, and like I felt so behind. Just catching pop ups, fielding well, ground balls, everything. We growing up playing in Montana, baseball's not a, a main sport. They're Absolutely. really big into basketball out there. They're pretty big into football. Hockey was huge. So even for our first years, we watched the baseball on TV, but we stumbled into baseball on accident. Right. Because we right. had a teacher who came to school with a flyer that said, hey, baseball trouts, any of you guys interested in trying out for baseball? And we're like super into sports. So we thought, yeah, like we'll do some baseball. Well, we right. didn't really 
it wasn't really ingrained in the culture. And you can probably imagine that being in Montana where it's, you know, winter nine months out of the year. So yeah, Dave started late. For me, it was a little bit easier, but only getting like two months out of the year to play. I mean, legitimately, and there's no indoor facilities back there. You know, we, we never hit inside in a, a gym or in, in a indoor batting cage. It was when May came around, you got to go outside, you dusted off your glove and you got to play a little bit of ball. Yep. We were lucky enough to have a big yard, Yeah, you know, so we, we were able to play in the yard and that really like the bulk of our baseball activity happened after our playing season, you know? So like you said, it didn't get warm until May. Yeah. Well, that was based like we were playing games in May and in June. I think we played in May and June. Yeah. Well, then when the season was yeah. over, we still had July and August were still nice right. months. So we then we to... played after the season the whole summer out in the yard as as many ground balls and at bats and games. And as then we it's could cold play. again by end September. of August, early yeah. September. You don't want to go outside and play right. baseball anymore. So very very different. Right. What's it like playing in baseball? The baseball itself is still baseball. Right. We played little league. Um, now I think they have travel ball out there and all the other things that everyone else has, but it was it was it was still baseball. The fields Awful. were not ideal. Like we played on gravel, like it was legit gravel. You know, there was big big chunks of rock on the field. And you remember was, that game that that I played up at Shields Valley and with the gopher hole, the gopher holes, yeah. and I slid into third, and I cut my oh yeah pants. Under, I used to wear, remember we would wear boxers under mm-hmm. our sliding shorts, mm-hmm. all the way through all three layers with like a script, like you're talking like pieces of rock. Yeah, it, it, we're not, we're not, you know, this is like literal rocks on the field. And I think that's the only way that they could keep the field up through the winter is right. to have like gravel, but go for holes in the outfit. I mean, the fields were rough. Oh, yeah. The fields were rough. Um, but I think at that age, you don't really care that much. We didn't know any better. Yeah, you know, you know. We never played on a good you're, field. You're definitely not afraid of the ball or anything like that. You remember the first time we went down to visit Grandma and Grandpa in South Florida, and we went to one of those fields and like the red With clay, like real clay. It was like, well, what is this? Yeah, and the humidity and the grass and yep. everything. And I remember like going back and thinking like. That's like really different. And so that that's, field is really that's different. where the story goes then. So right. We didn't really realize how different Montana was until we moved to Florida right. and started playing there. Right. So we got involved in travel ball right away. You know, the fields had real dirt on them. There was like grass that was green, you know. And, right. Um, and then obviously in Florida, the big difference there was you played year round. Yep. So we moved to Florida to start the school year in September. We had in our minds that we were not going to play baseball until the spring. We were going to play basketball right. in the fall. We used to play We didn't know fall ball was even a thing. And then we met some people like, oh, no, like fall season's starting up. We're like, fall season? Like, what is that? You know. So <laughs> from that point on, baseball turned into a two months out of the year thing into a full year thing. Right. You know, for me, when we moved, I was – 13 gonna be gonna be 13 in seventh grade yeah you were in fifth grade i only had two years to play catch up mm-hmm. until high school and i just remember growing a lot in the game in those two years big time you know like getting to florida like dale said we got there it was the new school year we assumed hey no baseball till spring i actually played basketball that fall Dale played fall. Dale got on a team in the fall and played right away. But I played basketball. I didn't play again until the spring. So I had to find a team because I didn't know that everybody else joined teams in the fall. Yep. And continue to play catch up. And continue to play catch up. I had to play up. I had to play 14U as a barely turned 13 year old on a brand new field. I went from being on the little league, 70 foot bases and 50 foot mounds, all the way to. 60 90 no have, no in between there was 80, no 50 54 box. 80 for yeah. you guys that that wasn't a thing um and dude remember getting like do you remember watching some of those games that i played that year like big kids it was it was kids. so interesting because it's like we went from the small town little league pretty much to like high school ball it seemed like right away it was like such a big jump yeah and it was a very, very, it was even a tougher transition for you, but it was like, 
what happened to the little game? What happened to the little field we used to play on? Right. You know, the the little two hundred foot field. Right. I know. Like and and it, it was gone pretty much right away. But yeah, I remember like that first year for you being a thirteen year old. This goes back to the first question that was asked today. Yeah. I remember there being like grown men on the field. Oh yeah. Like, Big I mean, kids. Those kids were like six two. You know, we didn't see all those kids playing baseball all the time. You know where we came from, and that was like, okay, like I guess. I guess this is this is what it's like down here, you know. And always, everyone always talked about, oh, in the warmer climates, they play baseball year round, and they're really good down there. But you don't really know until you get there, right? What it really means for a kid at thirteen to be able to play year round versus three or four months out. Just the year. polished skills, yeah. the skills that continue to build. You know, you don't you don't play baseball for two months and then lose it. Yeah, you know, and play basketball and football and you know, like you continue your skill. I mean, there are kids that still play multiple sports, but you continue your skills over time. That's why we had to play catch up. That's well, where for the people who are listening to this, you know, this brings up that conversation of like specialization. You know, like, oh, well, are you playing one sport or are you playing multiple sports? What's what's better to play one or to play multiple? I think in a case like this, playing multiple sports is perfectly fine. But you have to understand where we came from in Montana, it was not possible to play baseball in the winter, flat out, right. plain and simple. Right. You know, so if you didn't specialize, then you just didn't play sports for nine months. Right. Right. And then you waited to the season because nowadays when kids, they're doing, you know, football in the, in the fall, they're playing basketball in the winter, they're playing baseball in the spring, they can still go outside and hit in the fall and, and, right. and you know, maintain their skills a little bit. Right. That was what was really different. It was like, oh man, once September comes, you put the ball glove away. Right for months yeah well and once once we got once we understood that then it was like no looking back because you you quit basketball immediately once we moved to because Florida. i got involved in the fall got involved like, in okay, fall. Well, baseball is what we're doing i quit the next i quit basketball the next season because i was like okay it's it's full-time baseball yeah. and there was no question you know and then that next year that's when we started to get hooked up with some good people Yep. Like, you know, I'm thinking two people in particular that really helped us and shaped our careers in baseball going forward. For me in the fall, South Daytona Waves with Johnny Goodrich, mm -hmm. who was going to be our, our high school coach high school later coach. on. Yep. Um, and then for you, Dale DiOrio, who actually played for Johnny Goodrich early in the yeah. 2000s. We, we started to find some, we started to find some good, baseball legitimate people. baseball people. Yeah. Right. People that, yeah. that knew how to help us get some of the things that we were not getting like in those off season times in Florida just or in a, Montana. Just a level of instruction that we had not been right. introduced right. to. And that really catapulted your game. And that's your development depends on the level of instructors that you're around and the level of players you're around. You can't do this on your own. No. Even guys who are homeschooled, you know, guys who are homeschooled, they're getting really good instruction. They're working with good coaches. They're around other good players. You cannot learn the game on your own. You can't learn it playing two months out of the year. No, no, no. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I just, you know, that, that question was awesome about what was life, you know, life of baseball like in Montana. Um, it actually was pretty short lived. You yep. know, because we were younger then, she's like, oh, we played so many years. They played, what, four years of baseball yeah. while we were there. But, like, you said it earlier, you got to Florida and just everything changed so quickly, so very, rapidly. Very quick. That you lost track of how quickly you were moving forward. Yep. You know, so I just remember, like, going to high school then, and, dude, it was like, you it's were like on, going to war. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you were on a hamster wheel, and yeah. if you got off, that was it. You couldn't get off. Like you couldn't. You couldn't take a day off. Um, you know, just think about our first encounters in the weight room. Go back to that, man. Go back to that first question, even. Yeah. Right? First question. You know, the, the whole story of of growing up and being a baseball player is you get your ass kicked a lot of different times. Yep. And if you can kind of take those beatings and keep moving forward, you can learn something from them. But yeah, like you were saying, what does it feel like to get stronger? I had no idea. My favorite story is my first day in the weight room. <laughs> my first day in the weight room freshman year. Our coach was um, pretty adamant about doing a max out day to see who had gotten stronger over the summer. Right. Right. Maybe not the best strategy. Right. right? You know, but 
a, a good strategy nonetheless to get the guys excited. So, you know, some of the older kids, juniors and seniors, they were kind of pumped up about it. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm benching more. And I was a freshman. I weighed maybe 110 pounds. So my max out day for squat, bench, and deadlift was a squat, bench, and deadlift, I think. Maybe we didn't do a deadlift. I, I, think, we, I think we did, but I, I just I, I have more that. recollection of squats and bench. So the freshmen were paired with a senior or an upperclassman because I got paired with a junior. Yep. And, you know, you're going to spot each other and see who, you know, what the, what the max was. You're going to write it down. We're going to be retested at the end of the fall. Right. So I got paired with a junior, pretty strong junior. Yeah. Pony. You, you know who it is. <laughs> and he goes, all right, Dale, you know, what do you think you can do? You think you can do 135 at least? This is a squat. Right. So that's 135 is a 45 pound plate on each side. Yep. And I was like, I don't know, like, I'll try it. You know, I'm not going to shy away from it. Right. So he like, you know, cause his squat was what? Two something probably. Yeah. So he's probably sure. thinking, here's this little dude. He can probably do 135. So we put the plates on the barbell. You were talking about that feeling of the weight being on your back. Just yeah. like, God, that's a heavy weight. I got underneath it and I was just like immediately uncomfortable as if yeah. I didn't know I could stand up. This is your back. first time squatting. First time squatting. Didn't know if I could stand up. So he's kind of paying attention to me, kind of, sort of, not really. And I go to just even just try to barely bend my knees. And the whole thing starts coming down. Right, so at the last moment, right before I'm about to fall to the ground, he kind of scoops me up and kind of lifts me up and says, oh, dude, I guess that was too much. And I'm like, yeah, definitely too much. So I ended up, my max, I think, was 95 pounds. Right. My one rep max for squat was 95 pounds. Yeah. You know, so uh, definitely a, like, whoa, those kids are doing that much. I'm doing this much. Right. We got to get to work. Yep. So I just remember going back to my freshman year. Similar story. Um, I don't remember the squat as much. I remember the bench. I don't think your squat was as bad as mine was. I don't think so. I, I was probably a little bit more athletically ahead at that age. I think you were a little age. bigger than I was. was a little bigger, a little, little bit, just, just kind of a little bit more maturity. Yeah. Um, but I remember benching. And I remember like actually doing pretty good. For my first time ever benching, I think I did 95 pounds or something, or maybe maybe even 115. It was yeah. either a 25 or a 35 on each side. And I remember thinking, yeah, I feel pretty good. I'm as strong as all the other freshmen. And, dude, it for the next six months to a year, I, like, couldn't do any more. Yeah. It was like I, I was, like, maxed out for my maturity at that, at that age and that size. Well, and that's the thing, going back to the size thing, like – why why do coaches pick a bigger player? Capacity. Capacity like kind of for like more. That, that projectability. If you have a 200-pound freshman in high school who's a little doughboy and he's weak, there's maybe a little bit more room for that guy to grow. Right. Compared to like what I was. Like here's this 110-pound dude who can't squat the bar. Right. You know, like where's the capacity right. there? No, you know, like, that that was – Can this guy be a varsity guy for us? You know, like what – Well, dude, do and him? do you remember like how bad – we used to look doing some of the stuff too you, you know you do the bench and your butt would come a foot off the thing trying to just get every little piece in there and it's like you know this is not a knock on any of our coaches because they're baseball coaches they're yeah. not they're not strength guys you know but we didn't really have great guidance early on in terms of training it wasn't until what like my senior year you know jordan butler who had been around for the past three years, but he kind of took it upon himself to say, okay, like, we need to start developing We need to do kids. something a little bit different off the field. Yes. So much of our stuff early on was on the field, like hitting, running, throwing, right. fielding. Butler was responsible for saying, hey, some of these kids just flat out need to get stronger. Yep. Like, they're too small, they're too weak. So he really started to give us that... Um, that push and that push was super important for everything we've done. Like honestly, there. probably why we're sitting here talking about yeah. this right now. Yeah. You know, um, I, I legitimately, you know, found out early on through that process that that was one of the biggest things that I could do personally as a player to get better, was just get a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. Right. Well, and it was a perfect storm too, because you're saying that was one of the biggest things you could have done as a player, get bigger and stronger. I'm talking about how, you know, Jordan had such a, 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 
positive influence on us in that regard. But it started earlier because we we knew it all along. It was, it was like we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to get to it. We knew we needed something extra. Like, remember going on that cruise? When was that? That was like after my junior year. I think year. that was after, yeah. yeah. So all we wanted to do on that cruise was go in the weight room. And remember, you had to be like, if you weren't 18, you had to be accompanied by an adult. Yeah. And we were just trying to find a way to we go We were just trying out. to get in the weight room. We knew what we needed to do. We didn't know what to do when we were in there. We right. just knew we needed to be in there. Right, exactly. And that's the place that we need to be spending some time. And, and that's like, why <laughs> Butler's influence was so big on us and maybe not as much on other players. And mm -hmm. that's like, for all you guys listening right now, you you have to want to do it. And then you have to find the right people to like help guide you. It's kind of like first it. identifying the problem. Right. And then putting together the solution. So we had we had identified when I got under that squat bar is when I identified, holy shit, I need to get better. Right. Okay. I can field the ball. I can throw the ball. I can hit the ball. I need to get better. Right. Identifying the problem. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, like you say, with Coach Butler, when he really gave us the tools. Say, okay, this is how you get better. This is how you do it. Right. Right. This is what a program looks like. You do this on this day. And I remember just following with him a split for the first time. Like, <laughs> oh, this is upper body day. Right. And this is lower body day. Right. And then we're going to do core after. And then we're going to go do sprints. Like, just following a routine. Yeah. Do you remember that me, first, man. remember the first day we did, like, and this didn't apply to us because we were going to show up. Yeah. But remember the first day we got done working out and he's like, guys, you're going to want to not come back tomorrow. Warning us that we're going to be sore. The, the number one thing that you can't do is skip tomorrow. You have to show up tomorrow. Yep. And that wasn't a thing for us anyway, but it was like, he knew like, okay, like once you start this train, you can't get off the train. Yeah. You have to keep going because in reality, it's not a one workout thing. It's not a one week thing. Your dedication to getting stronger is a long term. It's a long game. It's a long game. Yeah. A long term. So much so that we have not been playing now for 10 years. Yeah. yeah, more than that and for me. We still train, like right. because it really became a part of, of who we were and what we did right. just to try to get better for the sport. And then you get to the point where you realize, okay, well, this, I guess this is just what I do, right? Yeah, it becomes, it becomes part of you just like as a kid, the game is part of you, yeah. right? Like that becomes part of you too. And that's like for you guys, you younger ball players, listen, hopefully you high school and college guys have already gotten to this point yet. But for you guys younger than that, like embodying what it is to be an athlete, like the, there, there is a certain level of discipline, even for you middle school guys, even for you young guys, there's a certain level of discipline. You got to take care of yourself. You got, you got to want to work on something. And sometimes that work is fun and sometimes that work is not fun. But like the motivation to do it has to drive it. And that, yeah. that like that's probably why we enjoy it because we enjoyed the motivation part of it. Yeah. We you knew know? we needed it. We found the right people. We got the tools put in place. And then I think a big thing for guys like you and I is once you start to see the results, you see the fruit of your labor, then you realize, okay, this is important. Right. So for me, going through my sophomore, junior, senior year of high school, got quite a bit stronger. Oh, yeah. Throwing right? the ball harder. Yeah. Sprinting so, you know, faster. You know, get those 60 times down. Yeah. Get those velocities up. And you realize, hmm, some of that was because of the structure and the things that we identified early on. And then once you realize that, you can't abandon it. That's right. like, it's almost like a superstition in a way. Right. Like you put your socks on a certain way and you go four for four. You don't want to put your socks on that way again because of results. Yeah. Same thing happens in the gym. No, that is, that's so true. And it's funny because when I left, like when I graduated and went to college, I was up at Capitol. <clears throat> I remember, because it was that summer that we trained with Butler. Yeah. And dude, I took everything and I said, this worked for me pretty good this yeah. summer. And I just, I just implemented it. We didn't have a great strength program up there. You know, no. Wyrick did some stuff with us, but... A lot of it was on our own, and I remember training, like my group of guys, like guys coming. We had to train a very good me. foundation, right? Going into college, we had a very good foundation because of some of the coaching we had in high school, right? You know, 
And again, just identifying that it was a huge problem for us was something maybe we put a little bit more emphasis on than some of the other kids. Right. Because when you get under a squat bar and it destroys you, again, you realize, okay, this is something we need to work on. So talk like, all right, how about the learning curve then? Because I'm listening to you saying that we had a good foundation and stuff, but there's a lot of kids who have good strength coaches and good coaches doing this stuff and they just don't really apply it because they're not interested in it. They don't apply it. Like we learned early on, like by the time we were both in college and going to the YMCA, creating our own training routines, we had learned what to do, what not to do. So much to the point where when we saw other athletes in their training, we're like, dude, this is a joke. Yeah, like, what, this are guy you, doing? what are you doing? Like, we, we had great guidance early on. Then we got to a point where we weren't in a situation like a lot of guys are in now, where they have access to all these coaches and all these instructors. Like, in our area, we didn't really, when we went home for the summer in college, we didn't have a coach. Right. Right, so we were like we had at, the YMCA. Best, at best sent home with like a mediocre little routine to follow. Yep. We would literally go to the YMCA and train, yep. write our own programming, and it was because of the things that we had learned that allowed us to do that. Yep. No, and and like I don't think some of that you can't teach. Like for the player to want to actually – take it on and learn it yeah. and live and breathe it is something different because let's be honest, there's, there's professional athletes at the highest level, major league, NBA, NHL, NFL players that they're not interested in learning it. No. They say, I'm going to hire this, this trainer for this amount of money and you take care of it. You tell me what to do. I'll be the workhorse. I'll do it, but you got to tell me what to do. Yep. We didn't really take that, that route. Yeah, we I mean, wanted to learn. It was just different, different, you know, situations for everybody but i think you know we do what we do for a living because of that interest right. exactly you know and exactly it, it, when, we, when we found out you know how important this was to our lives it it made us want to teach it to other people no 100 percent, and you know? you know just all the things too like not only playing but like it teaches you how to work <laughs> we can go a million different directions with this but you remember those Iron Hawk Olympics that we yeah. did at Creek. You remember the the Iron Olympics we did at, at Hell Week, Piedmont Hell Week, and you battled the other players. Yeah, in an effort to say, I'm going to show you what my body can do. I right think here. it comes down to you got to get uncomfortable. Yeah, if you want to get good at a sport. You've got to get uncomfortable. You have to seek the discomfort. And I've talked about this on so many different occasions. But when I found myself as a player doing the things I was already good at, seeking comfort, is when my development came to a halt. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to find like find something that you really suck at, and then find out how to conquer it. Yeah. You whether it's a squat or whether it's you hitting off the tee. Whether it's you locating an inside fastball, find something you suck at, and then find the steps to get better. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's it, what laid man. the foundation for you know what what we're doing, and you know the things that we we kind of instill in the guys we work with. Right, is trying to help them identify what is the weakness, and then coming up with a, a, a plan to attack it. Right, and that plan has led us all over the place. Right, you know, for you guys that need a plan too. Just comment below, DM us, ask us. We're here to help you. Like we're we're here to help yeah. in this plan. Like don't. It's very easy to to just say, I don't really know what to do. I'll just, just I'll just keep doing. Try to go about it on your own and just seek help. You know yeah. whether it's us, whether it's somebody else. Like seek the help. Somebody who who has the experience, who has the knowledge. We're here to help you. You know that's like Dale said. That's what we do. So you know you guys don't be afraid to reach out if you need some help. Definitely. Um, talking about the YMCA, do you remember two things? One, do you remember some of the freaking characters? Well, that's the coming thing. in and out I mean, of that. So place. many guys now, like even our guys who get to work out with us at our place, 
you get to be around other ball players. Baseball really environment. Yeah. You, know, you get to be around other guys who are, you guys all have a common goal. <laughs> I mean, we, we like go back to the crews and the YMCA. We found ourselves in some crazy places. Trying oh, to yeah. Train. Oh, yeah. And one of them was our neighborhood Y. And yeah. Yeah, I do remember. It was, it was a distraction, to say the least. It was a distraction. It was entertainment. You know, even, even bringing some of our buddies in there. Yep. to train they were like holy they crap. were like dude you guys work out here <laughs> like, well yeah i mean we just kind of do it and i think some of that kind of sp- speaks to just actually how motivated we were to train we yeah. we, we wanted it it we wasn't like all we, oh, we knew we had to get it done yeah they, oh it wasn't like oh this place kind of sucks so we'll just not train it was like no <laughs> this place but sucks. our particular we'll ymca if people don't if people don't know what a ymca is it, it's i believe it's a it's a a christian organization yeah right and so it kind of is like a, our particular YMCA was like a place where like drifters came through, yeah. right? Like a, a drifter is someone who just like kind of comes into town for a couple months and then they disappear and no one really knows who they are, what they do. And we had a handful of drifters oh, yeah. that were just like in their training for God knows what. You know, what's was funny is you had, it was almost one end of the spectrum or the other. It was almost like just your faithful, like your, you know, we lived in Edgewater, town called Edgewater, Edgewater faithful, yep. or your drifter. And there wasn't a whole lot in between. Like, honestly, we were the, we were drifters too because we were so seasonal. We were yep. only there for part of the year. And we would come Especially when we would go come home for, you know, for the holidays. college and drift. Yeah, exactly. But there was no other baseball players around. We weren't like, you know, hey, man, like, how'd your season go? It was like us and these well, random dudes. So I, I know, like a lot of our guys that train with us, want to know. They've heard our stories. They want to know yeah. some of the stories, and, and we'll tell a couple. But one in particular, do you remember the first year we were at Piedmont? I don't remember if it was fall break, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It was one of those holidays. We came home. We, it must have been Christmas because we had gotten some gear. We had our gear, so it must have been the winter break. So, like, we had those those green Piedmont shorts. I had an old yellow shirt. That was when we were wearing headbands. Headbands were a thing. You know, headbands were a thing. They're coming back, maybe. Maybe. The, now they have the, like the... Yeah, the cool ones. The cool looking ones. Yeah. You know, the ones that like Bryce Harper and those ours guys were like, wear. Like a, ours were like a... Literally like an old school basketball headband. Like a tennis player. <laughs> so we walked in the Y and you got this freak coming at Definitely you. a drifter. A drifter. Had this long, crazy long hair, freaking he hair. He looked attached, like he was like Middle Eastern or attached something. To Dave, and he comes up. He goes, "Hey, you play soccer?" He yeah, was like quizzing Dave, and I'm like, "No, nah, man, I don't play soccer." Yeah, and this guy's bouncing. Remember how much energy? He had. So much energy, probably on something like, realistically. But you know, we're trying to work out, and he's bouncing around the gym, like dancing in the mirror. But the thing I remember the most about that guy, we're going to put a name on him. His name was Gerard. I don't know how you spell Gerard. I don't know how you spell Gerard. I, don't I really don't even know right. for certain that was his name. I just that know that because that's what he introduced himself as. Right. But what I remember most is he used to do one rep max on the seated calf, calf raise. raise. So if you're not familiar with, with the seated calf raise, it's where you're sitting and there's like a big bar that comes out and you load the weight on the bar and then you just basically lift your heels. Right. Okay. It's an exercise that you want to do more than one rep. Right. Okay. There's no benefit you're going to get from doing it for one rep. But he was like insistent on... He wanted to load it up. One rep maxing out on a, an exercise that probably has what, like a two or three inch range of motion. Right. So he's over there... Loading it up with what four or five plates, asking Dave to go over there and spot him, like spotting someone on a calf raise. Is, spotting somebody on a calf raise is basically so the thing doesn't crush him. So it doesn't feet. crush him and like break his tibia in ten different. So do you so, remember the time that that he made Dwayne spot he made him? Dwayne do it. So Dwayne is our it. our youngest brother, yeah. and if <laughs> you need some background on Dwayne, if you ever ask Dwayne to work out with you and spot you. His way of spotting would just be like, get it up. Yeah. Come on, get it up. He'd kind of challenge you. He'd like that. challenge you. So which if is you really, good. which is good, but if you, if you really couldn't get it up, he was going to like leave it there. Yeah. Like you might actually. Need <laughs> so <it. laughs> Gerard 
made the mistake of asking Dwayne to spot him. And I think he had like six plates on each side. To this guy's credit, um, he had worked up his one rep max. Tremendous cast. High. Yeah, Tremendous cast. Well, he gets this thing off and he does it like one or two reps and he gets to the bottom and you can see his little feet start slipping. Start to slipping and quivering. And you know. Dwayne's just like, come on, get it up. Get it up. And, and he goes... <laughs> He goes, come on, come on, come on, come on, get it up, get it up, get it up. And he, he, you could tell he was about to get crushed. Yeah. And I don't think Dwayne actually picked it up for him. I think he, I think his feet like slid out from yeah, under well, the thing. The way the machine works is like you have your foot like this. Yeah. And you have to actually raise your heel a little bit just to, to remove the safety bar. Right. And then once you remove the safety bar, the weight will literally bring Crush your you. foot all the way down. Right. If you don't put the safety bar back up. <laughs> so he had got it up. And then he went down and he couldn't come all the way back up high enough. Right. So Dwayne's job was supposed to be to put the safety bar back in. And he didn't. So the guy like started to come back down and like, you know, foot shaking like that. Get it up, get it up, get it up. Don't think he got hurt, but it was, it was, it, that's just one example of, yeah. a, of a crazy guy, a, a wild drifter. Remember the guy you used to, you had the guy that, that did only biceps too. Bicep King. Bicep King. Yeah. Dad called him Slammer. Bicep King was probably a 20-something-year-old guy who probably had like 19-inch arms. And he wasn't a, a drifter. He, he was a faithful. He was like a faithful. He was an edgewater faithful. He was in there, but he really only did curls. Like, that's pretty much all he did was, was curls. So, um, we had him. We had uh, we had Kim. Kim, the trainer. There was a trainer who would just like bounce on the ball for, like, yeah, she would, she would, you know, the the big, uh, yeah, Swiss ball, Swiss ball. She would just like get on and kind of just like bounce in the mirror. And... Wild, wild stuff. Yeah. But wild the point stuff. here is that when you're training, the best situation is for you to be around other people who are trying to do the same thing you're trying to do get around some other baseball players get around some coaches because this was a distraction having right. to spot gerard in the middle right. of our work you know but definitely, definitely a distraction definitely a uh, good experience overall but it's just you know being being in the gym all the years seeing a lot of different things yep yep you know it, it's funny because we finished playing, and that's actually when we poured the gasoline on the fire for our training. You know, and I, I, I think to those couple years, like post playing, into like getting our full time jobs. There's probably like a two or three year gap there when before me and you both had full time jobs because yeah. you were in grad school. I was yeah. working full time, but you were in grad school. And our training, like we took it to another level. Well, because what happened, I think naturally what happens to a lot of people when they stop playing. You're 22, you don't get drafted, you're done playing. You need to fill that void. Right. And I don't care who you are, pretty much everyone needs to fill that void. Some guys get married young. Some guys have kids young. Some guys jump right into a career. Some guys become, you know, uh, coaches. For us, part of, of my personal journey and yours, filling that void was just taking one of the things that we could continue doing from playing, which was training in the gym, and just kind of like morph it into something else. Right. You know, we, we had spent the whole majority of our, our lives up to that point training for baseball. Right. Now we were like, all right, well, let's continue training and kind of attach another goal to it, which was maybe right. putting on a little bit of muscle, losing a little bit of fat, just kind of working on your physique a little bit. And that really for me, it was like an extension of my playing career. And it still is even to this day because I'm able to be competitive with myself All right. and continue to, to get better physically. And it was refreshing because it was something new. We, you know, we had gotten our asses kicked during our career, had the ups and downs. And it was like, oh, okay, this is like a new beginning. Yeah. I get to, tr I get to like fully immerse myself in training, Into having a training one calendar, one aspect. And... Like you said, kind of creating different goals. Like when we were playing, yeah, we wanted to put on some mass. Yeah, we wanted to look good. Yeah, we want. But a lot of it was performance based. And there's a lot of team based. Goals and there's a lot too. of yes. This changed it because it became very individual. individual about like how can I make myself better, not necessarily from a performance standpoint, but like the way I look, yeah. the way I feel, yeah. you know. And that was 
that was refreshing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think that really helped us get back into coaching because as we went down that journey, we continued to learn more and more and more about strength and conditioning and nutrition and, and coaching. And that brought us back to the sport in a very unique way because now we were coming back to the sport with a professional level of knowledge on maybe the thing that we needed the most while we were playing. Right. Which was strength and conditioning expertise. Right. Talk about Jordan Butler being the one guy really throughout my career who really gave me some good guidance there. Good foundation. Now we had built upon that and we're able to put it into our own program. Right. For our guys. Well, and it and it like you're talking about the knowledge, like we tested our knowledge. We everything that we tested that we our know knowledge, but we used ourselves as guinea pigs. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you look at doing the twelve week Gethin program. Twelve week we Gethin program, you know, just following programs to a T. And then creating our own after that, knowing mm -hmm. what worked and Starting creating our own build after our that. Our own programs. You know, we're gonna do another podcast at some point um, for you guys talking about some of those programs just and, programming. and yeah. how we put it together, it together, the discipline involved, the eating, um, some of our personal struggles in yeah. that as as twenty four, twenty five, twenty six year old men. Um, We'll do another show for you guys on that because that's probably another two it's, hours it's, worth of talking. Yeah, there's, and it is, it's an important conversation. It is. It is. Um, but just like you said, making yourself the guinea pig and then figuring out what works. And like that was so fun. Like yeah. I enjoyed that like so much. And I don't know that everyone does. I no. think I think you said it earlier. Some people, they want, um, you know, they want to know exactly what they need to do and they want it to be written down for them and they're going to follow it. And then some other guys are maybe a little bit more scientific and they want to kind of understand the principles a little bit and they want to kind of test a little bit and come up with their own stuff. Right. Either one works, but either one involves you having a plan, Gotta sticking have a plan. to a plan for years and years and years. This doesn't just fall in your lap. Right. Right. Like I think, this whole conversation here is identified when you find a problem. It's a good thing. When you yeah. find out you suck at something, that's a good thing. But there's a whole cascade of events that can come from you identifying that problem. And it involves Gerard. Yep. It involves... Well, you, you know, guys, you're, you're listening to what? Um, We've been in the gym for 17 years. Yeah, and, and even backing up to that, you know, talking about Montana, talking about... Um, you know, the bigger, stronger kids, talking about moving, talking about like when this whole journey started, I mean, you're talking about 20 plus years of experience that that some of you guys are going to have to go through to fully understand a lot of this. Hopefully we can help you and others can help you identify some of these things earlier and not have to struggle through them. That's That's what we're here to do. But this whole learning process it, it's it teaches you so much yeah. and and the people you encounter and learn from teaches it's you like so much the most cliche thing is when people say well just trust the process but man you really do have yeah. to just trust some sort of process that you can devote yourself to something that you know you need to do year in year out and the doors that will open up for you is right you know it, you might end up having a spot your rod along the way yeah and that might not be the worst thing for you well, you just like, yeah, I mean, it may or may not be, it could, could turn into something bad, but you know, like Dale said, guys, you, you have to keep the needle moving forward. If you can keep the needle moving forward and you can find interest in the challenges, like take it, take an honest interest and gather up some motivation in your challenges. You're going to be right where you want to be when it's all said and done. And, and you can't really put a picture on that. You don't know where that ending picture is going to lead you. That's the part you have to trust. So appreciate you guys for listening. If you like the content, if you like the stories from me and Dale, we're going to go find another gym right now to come up with some more stories. We're going to have to, we got, <laughs> we got to train today and we don't know where we're going. So be sure to comment below guys, like, and subscribe. I'm going to bring you guys some more stories here in the future. Um, hope everybody's enjoyed their holidays and enjoyed time with family. Uh, don't forget to keep training, though, guys. Yep. Uh, from Las Vegas this time, the Athletic Podcast. Catch you guys soon.